All right, I think, can everybody hear me? All right, um, I'd like to welcome everybody to our, uh, our first of our non-Black Swan event webinars. Um, and this is now in conjunction with uh, Kentucky Cattlemen and as well as the Minnesota State Cattlemen's Association. My name is Allison Vanderwall. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota State Cattlemen's Association. Um, and I'm excited to share with you um, this, this new webinar series. And we're kind of continuing this webinar series on um, with Nebraska and Kentucky and ourselves um, to really keep um, providing information to you all as producers across the country, um, um, just as that need comes out. And we'd like to emphasize that membership um, importance. Um, as we develop these webinars, we're really trying to hear what's really important out in the field and what you all want to hear and learn about as uh, not only COVID continues, but as we go through the year and what problems may arise. So um, with that, we really encourage um, membership and, and hearing from you guys on what you guys want to hear and learn about. Um, and we're excited for this webinar tonight. So with that, I will be uh, passing it on, I think, to um, Bonita to uh, say some housekeeping things. Hey, welcome everybody. Um, good to have you here um, in the great state of Nebraska. Um, just for questions tonight, we just want to let you know that your questions are welcome. If you click down on the Q&A at the bottom of your screen, you can type in your answers. Um, Elliot will be uh, monitoring those um, throughout our program, so he will get those to our panelists. So again, uh, we are live on Rural Radio. If you have any questions when you are listening online, you can text me at 402-450-0223 or use the Q&A answer uh, button on our screen. I am going to turn it over to Elliot, and I want to thank Elliot for his work um, helping us get our panel on tonight. Okay. Thanks, Bonita. I appreciate uh Minnesota cattlemen and Nebraska cattlemen and Kentucky cattlemen for putting this together. I think we have a really good series and panelists together. Um, as Bonita mentioned, we really encourage kind of the act of participation from you guys. Uh, this is for, uh, for producers and we hope to answer as many questions as possible. Um, just kind of give you an, uh, an example of kind of where we're gonna be going today. Um, roughly about you know an hour and a half the first 60 minutes, we'll kind of have uh, five uh, presenters. And really the main points that we're gonna be hitting on is uh, really four, need to manage risk and how these incidents with the Holcomb fire and also uh, COVID-19 has just kind of brought that to the front. Uh, and really kind of specifically talking about what market signals are we looking for to pull a trigger to you know, protect price and then we'll have a few people go over, you know, once we've realized that, okay, it is the time to pull the trigger, well, what triggers are we going to pull? Um, and then we'll kind of bring that all together and look at what does a marketing plan look like um, for both the cow-calf operator and also the feedlot. Um, hopefully that will generate some uh, discussion, we'll, some questions that you guys might have either individually, um, and we'll be able to answer some of those questions. Just as a, a reference, um, we have people from FC Stone and CIH, and we're going to, uh, and also from uh, Kentucky, uh, University of Kentucky. Um, at each one of the end of their sections, they have their contact information. If you feel like uh, something that um, was said interested you, uh, feel free to contact them, uh, and all the different cattle organizations will also provide that information as well. Um, so, why don't we go ahead and, and get started? I'll go ahead and introduce our first panelist, uh, Richard Jelnick. Uh, Richard has been the Vice President of, uh, of Global Education at International FC Stone Finance since 2015. His primary responsibility is the development of risk management education programs and materials on agriculture futures, options, and OTC markets. As part of these efforts, he also highlights other forms of risk exposure, including energy, FX, and interest rates. Kind of welcome you to the um, call, Richard, and we'll turn it over to you. Ron, here, Richard, you're gonna have you yeah, unmute you. There you go. All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, a few technical problems to start us off, but that's okay. 
Uh, my name again is Rich Jelinek. I'm Vice President of Global Education, but in short, I'm a teacher. And from this point forward, I do hope to get to meet you face to face at some point, and I will continue to be your teacher. Uh, today, we're going to talk about one of the most important concepts, which is price risk management. Before we get into that, we have a corporate document here known as our disclaimer. It's very important, well written document, basically says that uh, we all uh, Pete and Miles and I, we did our best to make sure the materials that we're presenting are accurate. So the first slide here we have is the importance of price risk management. Now, anytime you get into something that's new, you wanna know what's gonna to contribute to the success. All you have to do is talk to someone like Bill Gates and if you ask him that question, how he became successful, there's no hesitation. It's all about education. So I commend all of you that are listening to this webinar tonight because that's your first step in be being successful with this very important concept. The second factor though, success also favors those willing to change. Now I venture to say some of you are probably saying, well, my grandparents did it this way, my parents did it this way, so darn it, I'm gonna do it this way. Now nothing's wrong with that. You know, I'm, I'm not here to change any, any methods that are tried and true. But as your new teacher, I'm gonna ask you to continue that mode with a little bit of a twist. And that twist is keep your minds open, keep your eyes open, keep your ears open. Because when it comes to risk management, there's always new markets, new products, and a variety of new applications that could help out your ranch or your feedlot. So let's get into this million dollar word, volatility. You might hear it uh, again tonight. Usually it's a word you hear from professor or analysts or people delivering any kind of outlook, volatility. A lot of times they don't really tell you what volatility is. They'll show you graphs like I am right now. We got one on cattle, we got one on feeder. I could easily put some on energy. I could put it on corn. I could put it on interest rates because these are all different things that impact you. Today, we're gonna to be just focusing on the cattle side. And these are pretty scary, pretty ugly pictures for someone being in this business. So what is volatility? It's nothing more than a measure of your market risk. It's your market risk exposure. And as threatening as these charts are, they're very important. Because of these charts, it's telling you, you need to do something to manage that risk. But we also wanna look at it in a positive light as well. Because anytime you look at markets and you hear about risk, there's also another R word, reward. We won't, we won't refer to it as reward tonight, we're gonna to call it market opportunity. So we don't want you to be scared away from this uh, word volatility because there are a lot of positive things. One, it shows you the need for risk management and two, it shows you there is some opportunity in the markets. So my job tonight is to talk about a cattleman's market risk, the total market risk that you face, and it's price and basis. Notice the inflection on the word and. It's not one or the other, it's both. You have price level risk and basis level risk. So I'm putting it all together in one chart. Usually we'll spend hours on these topics, but we're gonna do it in a couple minutes. Whenever you're referring or someone is referring to your price level risk, they're referring to the futures price, whether it's uh, feeder futures or live cattle futures or corn futures. And what are futures? It's nothing more than a global benchmark, a global reference price for that particular commodity. And you see at any specific point in time, that futures price for cattle or feeders is exactly the same whether you're a buyer or whether you're a seller and regardless of where you are located in the world. It's exactly the same. And you can see what could happen over time. Prices could go higher, lower, or they can remain unchanged. But now we have to bring it home. We gotta bring it to Minnesota. We gotta bring it to Nebraska. We gotta bring it to Kentucky, to your territory, to your region, to your state down to your county, down to your city, and even to the physical market for cattle and feeders. And that comes, that is a way of converting that global futures price 
to your local market. It's a concept known as basis. Mathematically, very basic. Cash price minus futures price is basis. It's cash price relative to futures. And you can see things could happen to basis over time. It could get stronger. That relationship could get stronger. It could get weaker or it could remain flat. So looking at here, let's take a look at your risk as sellers. Your risk is that prices are gonna go lower. On the basis side, your risk is that the basis is gonna get weaker. So if you don't believe in risk management, and hopefully we're gonna change you, your opinion after all of our speakers today, you might be what we would consider a speculator. You're gonna speculate. You're gonna know exactly what's gonna happen in the future. That's what a lot of people think. So we'll put in the word guessing. If you don't believe in risk management, then what are your odds of guessing your total market risk correctly? Again, price and basis. Some of you might look across horizontally and say, well, it's probably one out of three. There's three different levels. Now, if you're a gambler, those odds aren't bad, but in business, being right one out of three times might not be the best practice. Some of you might say, well, wait a minute. I think it's one out of six because there's six different boxes here. And that's usually the common answer. Again, not very good odds being right one out of six times, but either of those answers, excuse me, both of those answers are incorrect. The actual odds, one out of nine. You see, if the risk occurs to you that prices go lower, one of three things could happen to the basis. So your actual odds are one out of nine. And I don't believe you're in business today willing to take on those kind of odds, being right one out of nine times. So when it comes to where do we go for risk management, there's basically four markets. And these four markets, they all evolve around one of them. They're derived from one of them. Futures, the futures market. But you can use futures directly by going short the futures, locking in a selling price or locking in a buying price for your inputs. And it's, you're locking in a level, not a price. You're eliminating the futures price risk, but you still have to assume the basis risk. Some of you prefer to deal in the cash market, in the physical market. You know, the counterparties there have a variety of uh, risk management products. They all require physical delivery. And if that physical delivery doesn't occur for one reason or another, there's gonna be some type of financial penalties. The next market is options. This one is relatively new. They've been around since 1982 on financial on the commodity side, 1984. And unlike futures, options are traded as part of the futures industry, but options, unlike futures, they convey rights not obligations like the futures. When you buy or sell futures, you're locked into a price level. With options, you have the right, but not the obligation to either buy or sell at various price levels. And the last market is the over-the-counter market, OTC market. And before we even say what this market can do, before you even get involved, you have to have a certain status. ECP, Eligible Contract Participant. And to get that, it's a little process, not a costly process, but it's going to take time to get it. So you could talk to one of your commodity brokers and they'll be happy to walk you through that process. You do need that status to be able to trade the OTC markets. Once you have it, you could find a swap dealer to work and execute these products for you along with your consultant. And the nice thing about this market, what's going to come out of it? creative, tailor-made risk management products, where you, the customer, are gonna be working with your consultant, working with your swap dealer to create something that is unique to your specific business. So now, since I'm the teacher, you're probably saying, okay, teacher, which is the best? I can't tell you. My colleagues from my NTLFC Stone won't be able to tell you either. Mike at CIH, he probably won't be able to tell you either. Why? Because they're all viable. 
excellent, viable risk management markets and the products with them within those markets are excellent. And there's unlimited amount of applications. So your job is to learn all these markets, all the products and all the applications because each one of them will shine under different market conditions. So in closing here, whether you're a small, medium or a large size operation, whether you're a corporate operation or a, a private operation, you have to accept the fact that you have market risk exposure. You have to acknowledge that you face market risk. Now, if you're smart enough to acknowledge that, then I think you're smart enough to go out and learn all those risk management tools and talk to your, to your consultants. They'll be happy to help you learn about all these tools. Not only how they work, but you need to learn how to evaluate them and compare them. So you working, you working with the consultant will be able to make the best, uh, best decision for your operation. Now these two things together are the key to managing risk and ultimately your bottom line. Thank you, Richard. Appreciate uh, the insight there. Let's go on to our, um, our next particip panel participant. We have Mike Maroney. Um, Mike is the head of a beef margin management team and at Commodity and Ingredient Hedging, commonly known as CIH in Chicago. Mike has a long career trading commodities, including uh, time spent on the floor in the Chicago Mercantile Exchange or the CME as a market maker. Mike also serves on the management team of CIH and is a consulting education and brokerage firm focused on helping agriculture producers to develop a comprehensive approach to managing price risk. Welcome to the webinar, Mike. Um, Richard, thank you. That was a great introduction. Uh, it's gonna feed into a lot of things that I'm gonna have on my portion of this presentation. Uh, the section that I have to cover tonight is when do you pull the trigger on risk management? Um, and that's a tricky question that I think, you know, is something that people really obsess about. How do I catch that moment where I'm gonna get all of the, um, the upside in price and then come in and finally put that hedge in place? Or how am I gonna catch the low in the corn market uh, and get my hedge in place? Uh, the truth of it, however, is that it's not a discrete moment in time where you're trying to nail uh, the exact high or the exact low in a marketplace. Uh, it's a process, and that's what I'm going to show you guys here uh, on my presentation. Um, Elliot, do you have the, you want to go to the next one here? Um, so I've got a handful of charts that I want to run through with everybody this evening and highlight a few things. Uh, as I mentioned before, the ideal time to manage that risk would be where those arrows are. Uh, if, you, if you know that that's the high in the marketplace, for sure, come in, hedge all you want. Uh, but unfortunately, you don't know that without the benefit of hindsight. Uh, so you have to come up with a plan ahead of time. Uh, next one, Elliot. So what I've highlighted here on this chart in green uh, is from a live cattle perspective. So if you've got cattle that are gonna be marketed against that Feb time frame, generally speaking, those would be placements during a window in fall. Uh, in this case, against the February contract, those placements would have been made uh, right around the time of that Holcomb fire. So we did have a lower set of prices. Uh, frequently, you know, your break even may be above the market or below the market, depending on how efficient your operation is. Um, but you've got to come up with a game plan ahead of time because you don't know what the future holds in store. Uh, as Rich, Richard mentioned earlier, there's, a, there's an array of choices available to you. You know, the most direct, I would say, is a trade using futures or the cash market. Uh, it's the most certainty that you can create, but they do have trade-offs. If you're gonna use either of those, there's an opportunity cost potentially that you're gonna, you're gonna expose yourself to. Uh, as you can see on this chart here, to the right of that placement window, there, there was a pretty substantial rally in the live cattle market uh, that took us up until January of this calendar year. You know, right until uh, the reality of COVID-19 hit, things were looking pretty good. Uh, next one.
to show sort of a different potential outcome here, here's the June contract. Um, so the board has contracts available that we can know what the futures price looks like going out, you know, at least a year. Um, in this case, marketing that would have been against the June contract, you know, when you were placing those cattle into a feed yard, and the same principles would apply for a cow-calf operation. Um, you know, you have feeder contracts that you can look out into fall, even into 2021, where you have a sense of what that future price holds. Um, in this case, in June, that first moment when you place those cattle was about the best opportunity you would have had to hedge the risk. But again, you don't know that at the time. So this will feed into a lot of what Miles and Pete and Kenny are going to say as well um, and, and illustrate to you guys. There are a number of alternatives available to risk management. Uh, one of the philosophies that CIH really espouses to is once you own the inventory, you own that risk. And so you have to come up with a game plan almost right away. So if someone was to answer or to excuse me, ask me the question, uh, when should I start managing my risk? I would say today, now, as soon as you own the inventory, uh, you're exposed and working either, you know, within your organization or with a consultant, uh, start game planning to manage that position through time. Uh, the, per, the profit margin that you have is an incredibly critical component. Uh, if you know you're highly profitable or you know that you're not in a profitable situation given the market circumstances, a lot of times that will drive the selection of the hedging strategy that you choose. Uh, as an example, if you're highly profitable and there's other factors that go into your decision making, that's where you might want to lock in that price. Uh, if you're in a situation where you're not as profitable, that's where an option strategy, which offers that flexibility, it affords you rights, but not necessarily obligations would be the better choice. Uh, I'll let some of these other guys talk about the game plan and the policy, but that's something that takes time to develop. Uh, it's a critical component in knowing what your personal situation is as far as pulling the trigger. Having a game plan will help you lead to those decisions. Uh, and then finally, we can cover a lot of these uh, during the Q&A section, but the fundamentals, what is the fundamentals telling us? What does slaughter look like? Uh, what does the cattle on feed look like? What are placements? Uh, what are the seasonalities of the market? Whether it be cutout prices, cattle prices, uh, live cattle prices, feeder cattle prices, uh, there's strong seasonality to many components of everything that's going on in the cattle market. Knowing those really helps uh, in choosing strategies and timing how aggressive you want to be in your hedging. And then finally, historicals. Uh, the the past is a guide. You know, when you look at where have we been? A lot of times that can help to decide where are we going next. So knowing those and investing the time to study up on that is a critical component as well. So ultimately, uh, what we really believe is that risk management is a process. Uh, it takes an investment and the fact that you're here on this webinar currently shows that you're willing to make a bit of that investment. Uh, as we've all been shown time and time again over the last, man, it seems like four or five years, uh, these markets are tremendously unpredictable. If you think of those charts that I showed you, uh, that Feb chart is an example. You know, we went from 120 down to about 106 per hundred weight on a live cattle contract and then back up to 120. You know, those are $300 per head swings uh, almost. You know, just being exposed to all of that risk is not necessary. So have a plan from the get-go, work with the team, whether it's internally or externally, and work on that from the beginning. Because ultimately, uh, as Richard alluded to, you know, knowing the future and being right, it's just too demanding. Uh, so all of these tools are designed to smooth out your returns, uh, get it so that you're thinking of things more from a business perspective than a speculative perspective. Uh, and although it can seem daunting at times, it's very manageable. And then finally, I just wanted to show this last chart. Uh, it's interesting because currently, you know, again, this is from a live cattle, cat cattle basis. Uh, the same principles would apply to feeders. But when you look at the prices that we've seen already on this December contract, you know, so if you're, if you're buying feeders today to put on feed, 
you know, that these windows about what you're shooting for right now. Uh, we've already seen board prices north of 120. I think we all have hopes that we can get back to those levels. Uh, in April, when the market was at its most distressed, you know, we were trading down around 92, $93 per hundred weight. We're pretty close to right in the middle. Um, and making a decision as to, are we going to go back to that 120 level or am I convinced that we're going back to the 92 level? Um, it's a very difficult choice to, to make one decision and say, that's what I'm sticking with. So again, come up with that game plan. Know yourself, work with your lenders and bankers, work with your consultants, and over time, manage that risk. And, and if you stick with it, uh, your results are going to be quite good, I would think. Um, as far as resources, uh, this is our contact information at CIH. Uh, we do have an online tool that I think is really helpful. Uh, it's called marginmanager.com. Uh, it's publicly available, no need to be a client or anything like that. Uh, there's video tutorials, et cetera, on there um, explaining a lot of the different strategies. So if a lot of this stuff is coming at you quickly, uh, again, marginmanager.com might be a good spot to go to. Each one of those videos is about seven or eight minutes, so it allows things to get broken up into small chunks that are easier to digest. So, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate some of the, the thoughts you shared with us. Uh, next on our panelists, we have Miles Bearden. Uh, Miles has been with the International FC Stone for two years, working as a risk management consultant on the meats and livestock team. His client base ranges from farmer feeders to large commercial feedlot operations to further processing meat companies. Miles graduated from Kansas State University in 2018 with a Bachelor's of Science degree in agribusiness. Welcome to, to the panel, Miles. Yeah, I appreciate it, Elliot. And uh, yeah, thank you for all the um, associations for having us on tonight. And um, thank you to all those listeners out there that have uh, taken some time out of your Tuesday evening to tune in. Um, I hope you get something out of it. Um, like Elliot said, I'm gonna be talking about um, risk management applications, uh, specifically futures and options, and uh, kind of just continuing the talk that uh, Rich and Mike have uh, presented so far. Um, this is just a disclaimer that you guys have already seen. Um, Rich already pulled this up, so we can move on. <laughs> so before we get into the weeds of futures and options, um, I just wanted to make sure we have a good understanding of the term hedge. Um, this is a uh, common piece of terminology that's used in the industry. Um, and I think it's one that is um, kind of taught wrong. Um, I think it's something that a lot of people have a misconception of, the, of the, what the true meaning is. Um, I think a lot of people, when they hear the word hedge, they think of the terms that are on the right side of the scale illustration we have here. Um, many people think immediately of futures, options, or OTC, if they know what, that, what those are. Um, and in reality, they need to be thinking of, of the big picture um, and, and what a hedge really is. Um, to, to, to see the result and to, and to see the true definition of a hedge, you have to have the results of both of these markets, taking your local cash market, um, whether that be um, the commodities that you're buying or selling and combining that with um, your gain or loss that you're having on your risk management side as well, um, whether that be futures or options or OTCs. So um, as we jump into things here, um, we're gonna start off with um, just a basic, um, just a basic example of, of a futures strategy. Um, so with this strategy, um, we are short or we have sold live cattle futures at 102, 100 weight. Um, and as you can see in this graphic, um, the benefit, the major benefit here is unlimited downside protection. Um, anything at or below the price of 102, 100 weight, we are fully protected on. Um, so for you cattle guys out there, um, this is a strategy that would be very applicable to you. Um, Obviously, you know, when you, when you take possession of cattle, the risk that you face is uh, downside price risk. Um, and, and 
over the period of time that you own those cattle, um, this is one of the ways that you can use um, the futures and options markets to protect that downside risk. Now, what you also see here um, is that you forfeit the opportunity to take advantage of any upside opportunity in the market as well um, when, you, when you take on um, this futures position. Um, so there, there's, there's definitely uh, um, benefits and losses um, to using these types of positions. But um, like Mike was talking about earlier, when you see opportunities where um, you may be in a break-even position or see a, a profitable um, price level on the board, um, this is the best way and the most effective way to lock that price in um, and, and, and move forward with that. So yeah, <clears throat> um, this is um, the same example. Um, we're gonna be short live cattle at 102 um, in the October futures, futures board. Um, this, this scenario gives us some, some what if situations. Um, over there on your far left hand column, we have what if scenarios um, of what if futures prices drop 20 or drop 20 cents to 82 cents? Um, what if futures prices stay the same and are unchanged? And what are what if futures prices rise 20 cents to 122? Um, in the second column, we're going to assume a one under basis um, at the time of sale, giving us cash prices of 81, 101, and 121. Um, with this, uh, with these these scenarios, um, kind of looking at this first column, if we see a futures price drop of 20 cents down to 82 cents, we're gonna have a futures position gain of 20 cents because we sold at 102 and we're gonna be buying back at 82, we see the gain of 20 cents. So um, like we talked about earlier in combining both our cash position and our risk management piece, we combine that gain of 20 cents with our, our cash price of 81, giving us a net selling price of 101. Um, moving down to the second column, um, in this situation, we have no gain or no loss on our futures position. We see cash price at 101 after a, a one under basis, um, again, resulting in a net selling price of 101. Now, this is, uh, this is where we see, and, and we need to keep the, pers the risk management perspective on, on hedging um, because it, this is where it's more important. Um, when we see a gain of, of 20 cents in the futures market. We're gonna have a, a net loss of 20 cents on our futures position. Um, and what you, gotta, what you gotta keep in mind is yes, that's a net loss on your futures position, but again, we're gonna still end up with the same net selling price because we were able to sell our physical commodity for that 20 cent higher price as well. So to answer some of these questions um, I have down here for discussion, um, First one is, would a change in the October live cattle futures price ever affect the strategy? And the answer to that is no. Um, you could go as far as you want below the 82 cents, or you go as far as you want above the 122, and, and the end result is still going to be the same. You're still going to have a net selling price of 101. Um, so what would affect the net selling price? What would affect it would be a change in basis. Um, to give you an example of that, Let's go up to that first column. Say we changed um, basis from one under to a one over basis. Um, in that situation, we would have a jump in cash price from $81 to 83. Um, futures gain and loss would be unchanged, giving us a net selling price of 103 instead of the 101. Um, so that being said, cash price and basis can affect your end result net selling price where in this situation, futures price change cannot. Um, let's see. Yeah, so that answers our questions there. Let's move on to the next slide. Um, so we talked a little bit about futures. Um, we understand how <laughs> we understand how they are um, conveying obligations. Um, we're obligated to offset that. And we're obligated to use that contract. Um, now we're going to move on to options and talk about how, how they convey rights instead of obligations. So this slide. Um, just, I wanted to just reiterate the fact that the, the time in the situations when we're going to be, um, you know, conveying rights, um, or when we're, when we're long or when we're buying options. So when we, when we buy a call option, we have the right to buy. And when we buy a put option, we have the right to sell. Um, when you're on the sell side of an option, um, it looks more like what you would see in a futures contract where you have an obligation to fulfill those options. <laughs> So moving into a very similar example we saw with, 
for the futures, we're gonna take a look at um, this option strategy. Here, we're gonna be long 102 live cattle put options at $5 a hundredweight. Um, when we're dealing with options, we have some new terminology that you have to understand. Um, those, the, the two main pieces of terminology that you need to focus on are the strike price and the premium. Um, strike price is simply um, the futures price that the caller put is referencing. And the premium is uh, just the upfront cost associated with buying that option. Um, so in this example, we have a 102 as our, as our strike price, like I said, and we have a $5 premium or upfront cost. So much like the, the uh, futures chart we looked at earlier, we still have unlimited downside protection. The only difference is that downside price protection doesn't start until $97 a hundredweight versus starting at the 102. And the reason for that is, is we have to account for the five cent costs that we um, had to take on up front. Um, so similar, similar aspect in price protection and downside. Um, the benefit to this would be, as you see, unlimited upside opportunity. Now, you do have unlimited upside opportunity, but you are having to eat the five cent um, premium up, that you paid up front. Um, so your upside opportunity is not gonna start until the 107 level. But anything after that, um, you're able to participate in the upside, unlike um, what, what we saw when we, when we were dealing in futures. So to give you um, some more examples of, of how this works when we apply cash and basis um, into the mix, um, the first three columns of this, this graphic here are the same as what we were dealing with earlier. Um, where we're gonna see the differences are, are in the, the, the put profits and losses and the net selling prices. Um, so let's look at this. So on the first column, again, we're gonna have a 20 cent loss in futures. Um, and that's, unlike futures, we're not gonna see a 20 cent gain in the put option. We have to account for the $5 upfront cost. So we're gonna have a 15 cent gain um, on our put option there. We apply that to our cash price of 81, giving us a net selling price of 96. Um, now, much, much on, when we move down to the 102, we're gonna see the, the very same thing um, applied. We're gonna have um, no, no, no uh, profit or loss um, in our futures position or our option position, um, but we do have to account for that $5 cost up front. So we subtract that from our cash price of 101 again, giving us a $96 um, net selling price. So in essence, that gives us a, a price floor. Um, we can go, um, futures can go down below 82 and we're still gonna end up at that net selling price of 96. Now, where we see the benefits here are when we see prices go higher. Um, so looking at this example, when we see prices run to 122, um, we see, um, that we still have to eat that cost again, $5 on the put option, but anything above that and any, any, any movement higher than $5 from the futures results in the gain and, and a higher net selling price. As we can see here, we have a net selling price of 116. Um, so to answer some of these discussion questions below, what would happen to the selling price if October cattle futures move lower than 82? I answered that earlier. We're still gonna be at that $96 floor. Um, so what would happen to the net selling price if October cattle moved higher than 122? Um, again, we're gonna be able to incrementally go up and, and move up in our net selling price as those prices improve um, above the $5 mark. Um, what factors could impact the net selling price and how? Well, in this situation, the futures price can affect the net selling price if it's moving higher. Um, and then obviously, again, basis, can also affect the net selling price just like it does in futures. So um, this, this slide um, just kind of goes over some of the stuff we talked about and didn't talk about. Um, in the gray, um, we're going over some um, producer sell side um, type risk management uh, strategies. In the red, we're going over some long or some consumer type um, uh, risk management strategies. Um, the two, at the bottom of each of these categories, um, just kind of give you an idea of the more complicated option strategies that we can perform um, and custom tailor to your needs is kind of like Rich talked about earlier. <clears throat> so in summary, um, I just wanted to go over some of the advantages and some of the benefits of, of using 
um, these methods. Um, first, take advantage of current purchase and sell prices, um, as Rich talked, or as Mike talked about earlier. Um, protect against adverse prices. Um, that's obviously the whole goal in risk management. Um, basis may improve purchase or sell price. Um, assist with planning and budgets. This can be a great tool in assisting, you know, as you look out um, over the next year or two um, and, and kind of get an idea of where you want to be on your budgets. Um, protect in inventory value and um, probably more importantly than anything, um, you're not tied to a specific cash market participant, buyer or seller. Um, you know, you're able to um, use whatever counterparty that, that you want and go wherever basis is best um, when, this, when this contract is, is over and you've offset your positions. Um, and then finally, um, just financial integrity of the, the clearing exchange um, and the benefits of dealing with that versus um, some of the other options out there. So. Yep. Thanks, Miles. I appreciate your insight on that. Um, just uh, just as a reminder for people who are, are listening to, um, if you need to contact Bonita uh, and text in a number, if you're listening over the radio, please feel to do so. And also if there's questions that, um, that you're kind of thinking about or just uh, maybe things that maybe you've been thinking about, just feel free to chat or put it in the chat box, the Q&A box, and uh, we'll get to those questions at, at the end. Um, our next uh, panelist is Pete Fish. Um, Pete is a risk management associate with uh, International FC Stone. He works with grain and livestock producers and cattle feedlots to assist them with developing marketing plans. He also uses, utilizes the No Risk Farm Manager as a tool to assist in tracking break-evens and positions. And this service is a consulting an advisory fee-based program. So with that, we'll have uh, Pete come on to the panel. I need to have you unmute, unmute there, Pete. Okay, there I am. Everybody got me? Okay. Yep. Yeah, we got you. Uh, let's Got me now. Okay, great. Okay, good enough. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, I uh, wanted to uh, give you a little bit more of a background. Um, what Elliot had said. I've basically spent um, most of my career either as an insurance broker or as a commodity broker. So managing risk has pretty much been in my background and my fiber basically my whole career. Um, and in some of the schools we have, Rich alludes to these tools as um, insurance and he uses the relation to it. So um, my background comes strong with that and managing risk. And I, you know, I managed physical risk before and now it's a matter of managing price risk. And most of that has to do with downside price risk, uh, especially if you're a producer. And um, I guess one of the biggest things um, I want to probably, I'm going to say it two or three times, and Mike mentioned it and um, Miles mentioned it, but knowing your break even is key. It's, it's huge to using these tools because if you don't know what break evens are, you're just driving in the fog. So um, I can't stress that enough. So um, can I move on to the next slide? Um, there we go. All right. Um, most of the conversation that we've had so far has been based on um, using um, what you want to call uh, forward pricing tools using the futures and options market. Um, I work with um, um, cow-calf producers and I also work with backgrounders quite a bit. And um, one of the tools that we discuss in our conversation is using um, video auctions. and. Um, Basically, all this is is a forward pricing tool. And uh, I'm sure there's people that are on here tonight that have used it before and uh, they're familiar with the companies that provide that service. Um, and um, it is a, um, is it real good? It's a, it's a tool to use if you're not comfortable using futures and options, um, especially on the feeder side. Um, they don't use they have a, a video auction or they have a, a live cattle auction, but the full, for the feeder cattle and the calves, 
Um, and Mike mentioned a little bit earlier too, we have a seasonality in, this ca in the cattle market and there are certain times to do this. And um, the, the forward price, using the forward pricing option of a video auction, and um, you might move on to the next one, see if there's something else on here. Okay, yeah, and this is, the, all, all you're doing with a video auction um, is, you know, you're, you're, you're consigning the animals to a, 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 an auction and um, a representative comes out, videos the cattle, um, and you um, tell them what you have and, and then they, um, they offer the service and obviously there's a commission to do it. But you present the cattle at auction at a certain time and um, there's terms and agreements that are um, set up in advance and the buyers know it and they are announced at the auction. And um, if you're willing to try to go out and capture a forward price, um, this is an excellent way to do it. Um, in the grain business um, and in the live cattle business, there's an opportunity, many opportunities to forward price grain when we've got some rallies or we have some strong prices. So if you know your break even as a um, either cow calf producer or as a backgrounder selling yearlings, this is a um, way to do that. And um, when the when the price is established, um, you know the terms are agreed upon and um, the price has been established and then the delivery can be you know they'll have certain time periods so if you know let's say in the summertime here they'll have some auctions for fall delivery for calves and it's a way for you to capture that and miles mentioned about the word hedge this is another way and this is a cash forward price way to do that um, it's not for everybody but um, it is especially uh, work for large lots and, lo and uh, load lots um, and then when there's some uniformity to the cattle. So I have a couple customers that use this regularly. Also, they actually buy on it and they also sell on it. So um, knowing your break even is, is, like I said, is really important for doing this. And um, so let's see. So we've moved on to the next one LRP, livestock risk protection. Livestock risk protection is um, it's an insurance product. Um, and um, I was an insurance agent for 35 years. Um, never really got into this tool, but I was partners in a crop insurance agency. And this is a basically a crop insurance product. It is underwritten um, and, um, by the government and the RMA. And um, this product is essentially like buying a put option. And um, one of the things that you have to remember once you buy an LRP, and we'll move on to the next page here in a second, but I, there's, there's several options which you get into, but um, when, you, when you set the price on an LRP, um, you have to see it through to the end. So, um, and that's, you know, that's, that's true um, hedging, but you don't have a lot of flexibility with it um, in case we have some changes in the market. So, um, the, I, I, I would suggest using this probably more on feeder cattle than on fed cattle. I, it can be done, but um, uh, you can use this on feeder cattle. And they have uh, price ranges from 70 to 100% um, ex and expected on the ending value. And that's no different than just taking on how much risk you want to take on. Um, if you buy crop insurance, you can buy a 65, 70, 75, or 85% level. And this is the same thing. So. This, and like I said, there's a lot of similarities to this as crop insurance. Um, you can add endorsements to it, um, and you know you're limited to four thousand per head. So it's another tool. Um, and the other thing you have to remember with an LRP is um, it's like the crop insurance. There's a there's a federal or there's a government subsidy in it, so it's paying for part of the premium when you buy this. So let's see what's life. Is that all there is on the LRP? Here we go. It's, it's like I said, it's basically a put option. It's, it's designed to insure against declining market prices and you can choose different coverage levels and insurance periods. Um, and you buy it from a risk from an RMA approved livestock insurance agent. And um, so uh, let's see, keep moving forward. Uh, let's see. 
One of the things that I do want to say about the um, LRP um, is it's tied to the options market. And a lot of times, uh, so for instance, back in March when we had all this volatility in the feeder cattle market, um, they weren't offering um, certain price levels. So it's, it's tied to that. And when the volatility gets pretty extreme, it's, it sometimes can be difficult to get into. But um, that might be one thing to consider. And there's no limits also on the numbers. Whereas on a feeder cattle contract, you know, it's a 50,000 pound contract if you want to relate it to this. If you want to do this for 10 head or 15 or 20 head, you can do it. So it gives you some flexibility. So let's move on to the next one. All right, this is an example of what a quote would look like. And this is on, let's see, this is on feeder cattle. Um, the, the print's kind of small, excuse me. Um, but this is based on 100 head. You take that top line, you pick your end date, you pick your ex expected end value, no different than buying a put option, and then your target weight, and then your pr coverage price, and then your coverage level. So if you take that and go down, you increase your coverage level, like I said, during that time period and your value goes up from there and your premium also goes up. And you see the word premium, that's no different than an option premium. So very similar to insurance, but this is, you know, when you, when you buy this, you're paying for this and that's what you're paying for. And you know, you're protecting your downside price risk. And you see where the producer paid premium is um, and then you have the total premium. So you see what the actual premium is and what your part of it is. And that's no different than crop insurance. So this is just another tool to consider. Um, there are, you can do this for also for live cattle, um, but these are just a couple of tools that I've been asked to just briefly address. Um, I don't, I, 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 my insurance license has lapsed, but I have um, a contact that's involved with this, um, though I got this information from. So, but in summary, um, in both of these tools in, in considering, um, knowing your break even is imperative. And then um, the other thing is also, you know, if, if you want to take all this on yourself, that's fine. But um, uh, I, I highly suggest working with an advisor. It's no different working with an insurance agent. Um, and they're going to be there to help protect you and protect your interests. Um, so, and they're going to know what your tolerance for risk is also once you get to know them. So. Those are some topics I just wanted to discuss, so appreciate it. Thank you, Pete. Appreciate that. And just for uh, people's information, here is the uh, contact information for Richard, Pete, and, and Miles. Okay, um, our last uh, panelist is Dr. Kenny Burdine. And he's an associate extension professor of livestock economics at the University of Kentucky in, in the Department of Agricultural Economics. He holds a BS, MS, and PhD in agricultural economics from the University of Kentucky. And he started working at the University of Kentucky in 2000 as an, an extension associate and then did his graduate work on a part time basis there. He joined the faculty. Uh, full time in 2012 and is currently an associate extension professor and his focus is primarily on marketing price risk management and more broadly general profitability for livestock producers. So welcome to the panel uh, Kenny. Thanks, Elliot. Appreciate that. So, like Elliot said, just real quickly, I've been at UK. I'm in my 21st year, and short of short of a basic discussion of cattle market outlook or something like that, price risk management is probably the program that I have delivered the most times in my career. I've probably done maybe 75 or 100 programs specifically focused on price risk management. In Kentucky, that largely means futures, options, LRP insurance, and to a smaller extent, um, forward contracting. And I guess I would say this, it's one of the more challenging things that I teach to producers, and it's also one of the more challenging things that they, that they learn. But I would encourage everybody out there to take some time and really try and invest some time in learning what Next. 
All right. So some thoughts from my perspective on why it's important to have a risk management plan. Um, I thought Rich did a really good job uh, laying out some things about the background of why it's important. But a risk management plan should be part of your overall business plan and then part of your marketing plan. And it really should play to your strengths. And I would argue that if we've learned anything over the last 10 years and think about the volatility that we've seen and how much we've seen prices swing from, from year to year, month to month, and even week to week recently, is that risk management is becoming an even more important part of our marketing plan. So you don't want to overlook that. The other thing I would say is that by formalizing it into a plan, and, and oftentimes that means at least a written plan or some sort of tangible game plan, you turn it into something you can actually put into action. You've probably heard the expression before that, that a goal that's not written down is just a wish. And I think the same sort of thing applies to risk management. If you don't have a, if you don't have a dedicated plan to implement, it's very hard to get the outcome that you're looking for. You want to be, it also is going to force you to have an understanding of the market and the market signals. And, you know, I really thought that Mike did a good job laying out some of those things. And, you know, you want to look, you want to look for opportunities. And then I think just as importantly, you want to seize those when they're there. And I thought he made a good point that you're not always chasing the optimal in the absolute best time to lock in. You're looking at signals and deciding when is a good time to lock in. Um, it also is going to force you to explore and understand what options are out there. And, and I thought both Miles and Pete did a good job laying out some of those, but you heard discussion of futures, options, LRP insurance, forward contracts, internet sale delayed delivery. You heard a lot of those kind of things and they're all out there. And you've got to make sure that you've got all those in your toolbox, so to speak. Um, you also want to make certain that you're, you're learning as we go. For example, I started my career in 2000. LRP and LGM didn't exist. And, you know, things like that are constantly coming down the pipe. Now, this is focused on price risk management. But a few years ago, you know, we, we had the option in Kentucky of purchasing pasture rangeland, uh, pasture rangeland and forage insurance, PRF. And that, that's another tool that we kind of added to our arsenal. So it kind of forces you to be constantly learning as well. The last thing that I think it does is it forces you to identify partners in your operation on the risk management side. And this can be pretty broad, but you know, you're, you don't do this alone. You've got your business partners yourself that you work with on the operation. You're also probably going to have uh, someone who deal who you deal with on the risk management side. That, that might be a combination of an insurance agent, commodity broker, a professional risk manager of some type. The other person I always add into these discussions is you want to be very open and frank with your lender about your risk management strategy. You know, they are a key player as well. So make sure they're at the table with you. A good risk management program should include several things. First thing I guess I would say it should include multiple strategies. You know, you, you don't want to have a single risk management strategy that you implement year after year after year. Something won't work that way. Um, and again, I thought Miles and Pete did a good job laying out some of those. But you want to be aware that in different markets and at different times, different strategies may work best. So don't be stubborn and be stuck on a certain one. You also only want to do things you're comfortable with, and I think that's very important. Um, you've got a ton of you got a ton of different things you can do from a risk management perspective. But, you know, I've worked with producers who simply cannot stomach the concept of margin call. Okay, now I, I think there's a problem. You know, if, if if you have that issue for forever, but in the beginning, if that makes you uncomfortable, let's look for things that don't require the potential for margin calls. You know, I, I have some producers that actually like to use covered calls as part of their strategy. I don't advocate them a lot, you know, but, but they're out there. But again, if you're not comfortable doing some of those sort of things, simply don't do them. Only do what you're comfortable with. This is, I think, just as important. Only do something that you understand. And, and I've learned this the hard way sometimes. You know, one of the most frustrating, one of those frustrating calls I ever got was from a producer. He told me that he had bought a put option and, and was getting margin call. And he said, how can that be? I thought it didn't work that way. Well, you know, he sent me his stuff and sure enough, what had happened was he had worked through a broker. He had in fact bought a put option, but he had also sold a call option and he didn't understand what that sold call option was doing. So he didn't really understand what he had done. So do what you're comfortable with, only do what you understand. That's what's going to make you the most successful. Your plan should acknowledge your risk tolerance. And that's very, very important. We're all different. That's personal. There's nothing wrong with being very risk averse. 
there's nothing wrong with taking the right kind of risk. And I think it was Rich early on said there is a trade-off between risk and reward, and there is. And you've got to be logical. Okay, how much risk can I afford to take so that I can get the reward that might possibly be out there? I've always said the best gauge of your risk tolerance is how well you sleep at night. And you want your risk management strategy to allow you to sleep well at night, you know, no matter how much money you've got at stake in the cattle business. Finally, your risk management program should include a solid consideration of your financial situation. This can mean a lot of things. A lot of people start with the idea of, I want to know what my break even is, my cost production is, and that is a good place to start. You, you, that does help you think about targets that you want to set. But I also come back and say, you know, sometimes you can't just be locked into that. There are times when you have to lock in a loss, and it's because usually because it protects you from having an even greater loss. So sometimes you have to do things you don't like to do, but you always want to start with knowing what your break even cost production actually are. You want to think about your vulnerability. You know, how vulnerable is your operation? Newer producers without a lot of capital are going to be much more vulnerable. They probably can't take as much risk they have. As you afford to do so. Most all of us early in our lives when we had assets that we insured had pretty low deductibles because we weren't able to cash flow much beyond that. As we tend to get more financially stable, we tend to get, you know, more, uh, we tend to become more stable, then we can afford to take more risk, we can spend less on premiums, and we can self-insure a bit more, and that oftentimes makes sense. Uh, next slide, Elliot. Thank you. Um, good risk management programs should set targets ahead of time. And I really can't stress this enough. There's nothing wrong with pricing very early. If you're a cow calf operator and you like what the market's offering, you can price way ahead of time. If you're a margin operator, backgrounder, stocker, feed yard, you can price cattle at placement if you want to. Nothing wrong. In fact, I actually encourage that in a lot of cases. So start thinking about it early. Um, you don't want to be in a situation where you're making risk management decisions on the fly because you've got to take the emotion out. You simply don't make good decisions when emotions are driving those decisions. You know, it's easy to look back at charts and say this was the top and this was a top and this was a bottom. But in reality, you don't see those things coming in real time. And it's very hard to pull the trigger when the market's running up or running down very sharply. And we kind of get analysis paralysis and tend not to do anything and burn us in the long run. Happened a lot in 2014. A lot of folks jumped on a market very quickly, okay, didn't like the result, or else they hesitated and lots of things get by. And then I had some folks who frankly, you know, jumped on a market early, really didn't really do anything wrong. Then sure enough, they were losing money on futures. They didn't understand what Miles said about the cattle were gonna offset that down the road. They were losing on futures. And then they got creative and they started, to try, they started to try and speculate their way out of that position, which just kind of compounded the problem. So. You want to take the emotion out. Third, don't look back after decisions are made. And I tell people all the time, you know, when you make a risk management decision, you do it because you like what you're locking in or you like what you're taking, period. And when you do that, you reach up, you grab the rearview mirror on the truck, and you rip it off. And you don't look backwards anymore. You make risk management decisions in, in, in a full, you make risk management decisions looking forward, not looking backward. Um, last two things, maybe the most important. Understand that your goal with risk management is you're looking for long-term stability. The best risk managers are not the people that make the most money on a given year. Okay, They're not the ones that lose the least on a given year. They're the ones that over the course of their career, year after year after year, they take out a lot of those lows. And frankly, they give up some of those highs. And that's just how it works. You're looking for base hits, not home runs. Finally, I always tell people when it comes to risk management, my basic advice is protect the downside first, then worry about upside. And upside is important, right? My philosophy is simple. I want to cover my downside first, then I'll worry about upside down the road. It's human nature for folks not to want to leave money on the table. It drives us crazy if we lock in a profit level of a certain amount, our neighbor does nothing and makes twice as much as we do because they didn't protect their prices. That's going to happen sometimes, okay? And I always come back and say the opposite that I'll say, if you're not leaving some money on the table occasionally, you're probably taking too much risk. 
So in reality, a good risk manager is one that some years will jump on a market soon and not make as much as they could have. And in a lot of other years, they'll be a whole lot better off because they covered their downside. Last slide, Elliot. Thank you. My contact info, um, you can reach me by phone, email, or follow me on Twitter. Be glad to hear from you. And I appreciate the opportunity to visit with you tonight. And I thank you to everyone for the invitation and for everyone who has logged on and listened. Thanks, Kenny. I appreciate uh, you uh, sharing with some, that information with us. Now, as, as promised, we, uh, we have our 30-minute uh, Q&A session. Um, any of the people that we, that's been on the panel is open to asking questions. Um, feel free to some chat, put some chat in the, in the Q&A box. Um, also, if you feel more comfortable talking um, offline, uh, we've also will provide the contact information for each one of the panelists and um, you can contact them on your uh, on your own time let me just check the chat here real quick we got a question that came in okay so this is for Kenny uh, it says most cow calf producers in Kentucky have 40 to 60 head oftentimes less uh, what are your thoughts should we be price takers and move along I understand all we all want to protect our downside, but at what level is it worth, or it's what more work than it's worth? Thanks, Elliot. So really good question there, and I'll address as best as I can, and certainly anyone's welcome to chime in as well. So the basic question is about, you know, a lot of cow-calf operators are, are gonna be small which means that they, they have a, a more limited range of price risk management options. So the question is, is it really worth investing the time? Um, in my opinion, it is, and here's the reason why. Although some of those smaller operations may have, may have less total money at stake, in terms of the impact of those decisions on a per head basis or on a percentage basis, they're just as significant. So you do have some options. I think it was, it was, um, oh, it was Pete that talked about LRP insurance. LRP insurance is really the first tool that we've had available for folks that is truly scalable to small sizes. You know, you can buy LRP insurance on a very small quantity. So I would encourage you to start looking there. Beyond that, even if you're a smaller cow-calf operator, there are still other things that you can do to, to manage risk. So the quality of cattle that you have, lot size that you sell in, think about working with other producers, you know that you can do to add value to your cattle, but, but the best tool you've got if you're a small operator is LRP insurance. So put that one in your arsenal. Thanks, Kenny. Appreciate your thoughts on that. Okay. Uh, next question is, since futures and cash determine your strategy, uh, what do you use to determine these? Fundamentals, technicals, or both? Do you have some tools you'd prefer to do this? And let's have uh, Mike from CIH answer that for us. Yeah, sure. Um, it's a great question and trying to find the specific answer uh, can be tough. I would say knowing the fundamentals is critical. Uh, so as I referenced earlier, the USDA in particular has a tremendous amount of information available to you. Um, you know, you can get it through directly through the USDA or, you know, any number of channels. Um, as far as fundamentals go, you know, you really do need to know what the cattle on feed numbers look like. Bigger trends, in my opinion, matter. You know, are we in expansionary phase? Are we in a contractionary phase? Uh, knowing that will, I think, help to, you know, point the ship in the right direction. Should we expect to see an up market or a down market over the next, you know, 6, 12, 18 months uh, is the window that I would want to be focusing on. Um, as far as technicals go, you know, getting a good sense of what charts look like um, and keep it simple. You know, are, are trends generally up? You know, somebody wants used a line on me when I was a young trader and it really it impacted me a lot. He said trend lines should be drawn with crayons, not with rulers, meaning get a general sense of what that trend looks like. Um, you know, you want an idea, but you don't want to try to say, hey, you know, this is exactly what I'm shooting for here. Again, it's a general trend. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate your thoughts on that. Uh, next question came in. Uh, could you address strategies to manage basis of uh, 15, you know, positive 15, like we were seeing on the live cattle April contract this year in, in Nebraska, or large swings in basis or low volume of cash trade. 
And for that, let's uh, let's ask Miles to uh, address some of that or that question. Hold on here, Miles. I can't hear you. You're still muted there. There you go. Can you get me now? Okay, so um, so yeah, obviously, uh, basis is always something that's going to be a risk and always something that you're going to have to deal with when using, you know, the futures and options uh, risk management tools that we were talking about. Um, that being said, there is a tool that we offer um, to some of the eligible contract participants, like like Rich was talking about um, in our OTC marketplace, that does allow you to lock in um, basis and futures all in one contract. Um, that's something that uh, I would love to chat with with those of you who that may apply to, um, you know, one on one on the phone. Um, outside of that, um, just using um, you know basis contracts with your packer. Um, I think that's that's the other other way to to manage that risk. But um, in reality, there's always going to be that basis risk when you're when you're taking on these positions. And as we see right now, I mean, we're sitting sitting in a situation today where we're seeing you know, 15, 16, 17 cent over basis. So something that's tough to manage and uh, and in black swan events like we're seeing and have seen this year, it's it's not an easy thing to manage for sure. Thanks, Miles. Um, next question that came in, the cash in the futures market seemed to be in a disconnect evidenced by the unusually high basis we've observed lately, kind of going off what you were saying, Miles. Um, this is making hedging almost impossible nowadays. What is your expectation about basis going forward? So why don't we do a little tag team here? Why don't we have maybe Richard talk a little bit about kind of the fundamentals between the cash and um, and the futures market, and then let's uh, let's maybe have uh, Mike and Miles talk about maybe some of their expectation of, of basis. Well, thanks, Elliot. I was hoping to be able to chime on uh, basis. Uh, as an educator, uh, I always tell my students that the key to successful risk management is that one word, basis. And, and I always joke with them, I tell them, if you want to be successful in risk management, you have to be the greatest SOB in the world. And they look at me kind of strange, and then I tell them what SOB is. It's student of basis. Uh, that's one of the best ways, you know, the, uh, Miles talked about the OTC markets. There's some cash contracts that are able to lock in basis. Uh, but for me, one of the best, especially on the feed component, uh, you know, if you're a good student of basis, tracking basis on a regular basis, you're going to see a lot of historical uh, uh, and seasonality, or excuse me, seasonal trends in basis. Thanks, Richard. Mike, anything to add to that? Yeah, I think the basis right now, particularly on the live cattle, um, is an incredible challenge. Uh, with the backup in slaughter that we've seen, um, you know, the Packers are putting out a cash bid, you know, 118 to 120 uh, on what is trading. Uh, the June board is, it's a physical delivery settled product. Um, and so there's a lot of cattle that aren't trading at that 118, 120 cash price. And so uh, the board itself has to price accordingly. Um, and so there's a large disconnect in basis currently. Uh, in my opinion, if you look at where, you know, the futures curve is currently, um, I think we will probably past July see basis that's a lot more in line with historical averages. Um, but right now we're just caught in a situation where with the backlog in, in market ready cattle um, and some cattle trade at that 118, 120 level, but still not a lot being able to trade at all. Uh, the board's kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place, and you've got this strange basis situation. Thanks, Mike. Uh, had a similar question come in that I'll, uh, if you could answer this in conjunction with the past question, Miles, uh, what's the best way to track and evaluate basis? There we go. Um, so yeah, basis is uh, basis is something that's not very easy to track. Um, it's one thing, one of the services that we provide um, to our customers. Um, I think uh, we typically do a good job of tracking um, local basis in areas that um, our customers are dealing in. Um, on an individual level, um, you know, just 
there, there, I don't know. Um, some of you guys may chime in too. I'm not sure there is a, a good, good tool out there to be able to track the basis on, um, as far as individually. All right. Hey, thanks miles. Appreciate that. Pete, we got a couple questions for you. Uh, we'll kind of combine these questions. It says most cow calf operations have a cost to run a cow calf operation around a thousand a year plus with feeder cattle prices where they're at. What is the upside to use futures or LRP or any other strategy going forward and kind of conjunction on that if you want to talk a little bit about how LRP can be a little bit more user friendly. There we go. Uh, um, using the LRP, like I said, I, I, you, I have not used it very at all. I use it with most of my customers. What, what I'm able to do for a cow-calf producer, uh, Mike alluded to it a little earlier, with the seasonality in the market as a cow-calf producer, and it all depends on if you're gonna sell the calves in the fall or if you're gonna retain them and keep them through the winter or if you're gonna retain them and go ahead and feed them out yourself. Um, and each one of those options is open to you, obviously, and if you got a lender that's gonna work with you. Uh, it was interesting this spring, oh, I've got half a dozen or so guys that'll raise, you know, we have two, 300 cows. And um, as Mike said, we were going into the spring with really good prices, and um, it looked like the thing to do was to retain ownership on those cattle. And um, we did it. And um, when we did it, we obviously went out and protected the downside price risk. And we've been rewarded accordingly um, by, you know, picking the month we were going to have the cattle. And then we would, we were doing buying puts and selling calls or we were just using futures. But there again, um, you know, I'm going to say it again, knowing what your break even is, as an, even as a cow-calf producer, because you know what your costs are and then you know what your cost of gain could be going down the road. And if you put the genetics into those animals and you know they're going to perform, and you know, if you've got some historical, um, you know, um, carcass information on the cattle and the genetics that you have, um, you know, putting them on, a, on the grid, you're going to get a return on that. If they're all black, you're going to get a CAB premium. So um, with all that being said, um, using, using the futures and options market, um, and that point was really something good. I have another producer that I work with. Each spring, uh, he retains ownership on all his animals. And um, each spring, usually, this year's been unusual, but usually in April when we get a rally in the market, we go ahead and um, price, or we um, hedge the cattle in the next April board, and then we go ahead and start hedging our corn at the same time, because there's a seasonality to the market. And Mike alluded to that earlier, so. Thanks, Pete. Um, kind of, Kind of to follow up with that, Kenny, when, when you answer a little bit about how LRP can maybe used uh, um, on fed cattle and potentially maybe for feedlots, so maybe looking at um, feeder cattle and then just kind of a, just opinion about uh, livestock gross margin for fat cattle. So admittedly, I don't deal with as many fat cattle as probably the other folks that are out further, further west. But in general, I do like the LGM concept. It works reasonably well. Um, it, it, you're, essentially, you're essentially looking at both the, the sales side on the cattle and the, the feed price at the same time, which I like the concept. You've got to compare that, though, to what you do with a uh, mixed option strategy or something. It's essentially, you're, it's, you're essentially getting a put on cattle and a call on the corn is what you're doing. So like your reason, we'll always tell folks price it with other options that will look at what's out there. Thanks, Kenny. Um, all right. Uh, so next question, do you recommend uh, cattlemen or cattlewomen implementing risk management strategies all on all cattle they own, or is there a benefit in rolling or a benefit to only rolling a portion of their cattle and risk management strategies or programs? And with that, we'll, we'll pass that off to, to Richard. There you go. Thank you, Elliot. Uh, I think it was Mike that mentioned it, maybe Kenny, uh, talking about the tolerance of an individual operation. You know, that's going to uh, go a long way in determining uh, 
what percentage of the herd's gonna be uh, under risk management, as well combined with where the markets are. Um, one thing that I would say, just as a general term, that's what us educators do, keep everything general. Mike's um, topic today, the outlook, the analysis, is a very big part of risk management. As we talked about, you have to understand all the different tools available. You have to learn how to evaluate them. And sometimes different tools are pretty close. So your market opinion, you know, working with a good analyst, getting a good uh, feel for where the market's gonna go is gonna help you make those kind of decisions uh, of when to get in, when to get out, and also to what percentage of your, uh, your herd you want to have under risk management. Thanks, Richard. All right, and then just more of a broader question. Um, let's maybe have uh, Miles and, and Mike uh, kind of touch on this. Um, let's first talk about uh, maybe a good website or calculator that you feel to, as a feeder or grower um, for cost of production or break even forecasting. I know, you know, your companies might have um, uh, different options. Start with Mike. Um, I know CIH does have tools like that, uh, that we use with our clients. Um, I'm trying to think of a good, just publicly available one. And I'm drawing a little bit of a blank on that. Um, Miles, do you have anything in mind on that specifically? Um, if you want to help with it, reach out to us, we can help you, but I, I can't think of a public one. Yeah. So, uh, me and Pete, um, we've actually built our own. We have one that, uh, we use for our customers and make available to them. I want to say um, some of the universities may have some on, yeah, on their ad sites. Um, yeah. Maybe K State and try there. I'm I'm pretty sure there's one one on their site. So, thanks, Miles and and Mike and I and I can speak. For, I know K State does have one. UNL has one, and also uh, University of Kentucky has one. And those vary by a lot of those are going to vary by the region. Um, but as Mike and Miles mentioned, uh, there's also those options if you go with uh, your broker that they can provide a, a more customized version of that. Um, let's maybe talk a little bit about uh, ag lenders requiring risk management or margin protection to obtain loans, something that's been getting kind of a lot of discussion. Uh, let's maybe have uh, Richard and Mike talk about that. And we'll start with Mike. Okay. Uh, you know, risk management is a team effort, I think, between, you know, the operation, uh, having a set group of people within the organization that are responsible for that, uh, as well as a risk management consultant and the lending group, uh, all being a team on that. Uh, it's, it's critically important. Uh, I know a lot of lenders will um, extend credit based upon what percent of the inventory is hedged. Uh, which leads kind of into another question that somebody asked, you know, do you want to do it on all of your inventory, some of your inventory? Um, again, I don't think you should jump in 100% into risk management if you're not comfortable with it. Uh, as you grow more comfortable with it and your team uh, as a whole understands what your objectives are, sure, get more and more involved. Um, but lenders and risk management, you know, their, their objectives are very similar. Um, and, and lenders do try to incentivize risk management by making terms more favorable for hedge cattle. Thanks, Mike. Richard? Thank you, Elliot. Um, I've been around for a while, and there, there was a, an agreement back in the 80s and 90s, and maybe even the early uh, 2000, that was real popular. It was called a tri-party agreement. And it was a excellent agreement between the customer, the lender, and the FCM. And what was so important about this, many lenders started to realize they needed to see some way, some shape, some form, that they were gonna get those, those loans repaid. And so this uh, tri-party agreement went a long way to it. And it also got the lender more involved in the markets to the extent they at least knew about what hedging, true hedging is and the operations of the market, especially when it comes to margin call. And because many times you would hear about a customer that would have a perfectly viable risk management plan in place 
and all of a sudden they were kicked out because their their lender wasn't going to come up with the additional uh, uh, cash for the, the margin requirements. So uh, I'm not sure to what extent these uh, tri-party agreements are still out there, but uh, they should be because it was an excellent uh, approach to risk management. You know, as Mike was saying, it, it's a, it's a it's a team effort. Thanks, Richard. Have a few more minutes. We'll ask, ask these two questions, answer these two questions. But if you do have additional questions, feel free to continue to chat or write them in the chat box, and then uh, we'll try to do our best to answer them offline. Uh, we'll have a, maybe Kenny talk about this. Uh, is there? There's a great deal of talk in policy circles that's been going on about the mandatory cash trade or a negotiated 30, 50 percent. Uh, what's your opinion on this, um, and how do you think it'll maybe affect the market long term? Well, you gave me a doozy there, Elliot. You know that, right? <laughs> yeah, that, that one's a tough one. <laughs> so, no, it's a really good question. Hot topic right now, and you know, it, there there's so many things right now that are controversial in the industry, and, and a lot of folks know for. For a lot of reasons, but the decline in negotiated cash cattle sales has been ongoing for a while. Um, I, if I'm not mistaken, we're somewhere in the ballpark of 20% total that are actually discovered on the spotter cash market. It's also very regional. I think that's something that we've learned. There's been some work done in the last, I don't know, probably over the last 10 years looking at this, and it's very, very regional. You know, we we have some some markets that are actually do a pretty good job discovering price, and some that simply don't. I go back though to what some of the work that's been done is pointed to, and it's pointed to the fact that over time, most of these arrangements have actually led to higher prices. And I think that's important to understand. Most of your most of your prices most of your prices that are not discovered on the spot market are formula based, so they're based on something else. So there's a legitimate question about how important that that base market is. We have to be realistic though. If we do impose something like this on the market it's going to increase cost on those that are making those transactions, right? And it's going to change, it has to force them to change their business. And I think that's probably a cost that gets passed on and ultimately does not add value. Don't get me wrong. I would love to see more cash cattle, more, more prices discovered on the spot market, but I do worry about the economic impacts of simply forcing a, a hard and fast rule like that on the industry. Yeah. Thanks, Kenny. Yeah. Any of those uh, impacts that are going to be, uh, enforced at the, the feedlot level are ultimately going to be passed on to cow-calf producers. And I think a good thing to remember is that um, you no know, one forced anyone to do formula contracting. There's economic incentives there for producers to go in price formula uh, cattle. Um, and so whether, you know, as you know, in Nebraska, a lot of cash trade, Texas, the Texahoma region, very, very thin. Um, so I think we just have to be concerned that potential are creating wedges for uh, profitability for, for everyone along the, the chain moving forward. Okay. And our last question, uh, for one, we have Pete answer this, uh, what do you, do you feel like the RMA calculator is correct? Uh, maybe there's some concern about, um, as you're saying, the volatility that ha happens, you know, with LRP being priced on the, on the option market. Uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about a little bit more about how that's how those prices are derived and we have about you know see if we can do it under 60 seconds so we can kind of wrap this thing up well, this probably shouldn't be pretty easy because um, I'll relate it to when um, I had some customers that had some put options on and feeder cattle during the um, March um, black swan event and COVID and everybody in this business remembers that week because it was incredible. But I had tr trying to make a market with such small um, open interest and volume. The bid ask is so big and Rich does a wonderful job in his schools about figuring out what bid and ask is. And when it's that big, I don't know how you make a market. It's, it's just incredible to try to, to do that. And so when you get into a thin market like that, it's very, very difficult to establish what the price is. And we were doing the same thing in the live cattle market. Nobody knew how to price the cattle. 
there was just such a huge disparity between bid and ask, and there was fear running rampant. So I don't know to answer that question about the RMA. It's just a matter of, you know, we had to work our way through it. It was, it was a challenging time. Yeah. yeah thanks Pete. And I think uh, often in those, on those moments, right, when we're in the middle of a, a disaster is probably not the best time to p implement risk management strategies. It's, you know, it's an ongoing process as the panelists kind of described. Well, I'd just like to thank uh, this end of our time, like to thank uh, Miles, Mike, Richard, Kenny, Pete, um, for just being here on the panel, helping us uh, understand a little bit more. Once again, my name's uh, Dr. Elliot Dennis at University of Nebraska-Lincoln, Department of Ag Econ, and with that, I'll turn it back to you, Bonita. Are you with us, Bonita? I think I'm gonna wrap it up, Elliot. Okay, Becky, Thank pass you it to you. Um, my name is Becky Thompson. I'm with the Kentucky Beef Network. We're proud to be a partner for this webinar series. And we really appreciate all of our attendees tonight and their great questions for our panelists, as well as our panelists' time and your great recommendations on marketing and risk management strategies for our respective producers across the industry. Um, as we close, we look uh, the Kentucky Beef Network, Minnesota Cattlemen, and uh, Nebraska Cattlemen are looking forward to continuing this webinar series, and we'll continue to be exploring topics for future, uh, for future sessions. Uh, please mark your calendar for July 7th. Uh, that will be our next topic, or our next webinar, and we will be seeing out more details soon. Thank you all, and have a great evening.